while crossing the Mississippi River on the Natchez Vidalia Bridge gives you a real sense of the magnitude of the waters below and the engineering challenges needed to circumvent them. On the eastern side is the historic city of Natchez, its upper streets lined with antebellum mansions and the lower shoreline with under the hill saloons. My first priority was a little relaxation after a long drive. Well, here it is. Nachos and Natchez. What could be more fitting? It was the perfect spot to grab some grub and admire the magnificence of the Big Muddy. To the Mississippi and to the east. Oh, that's nice. Mm. Now that's a beer. Besides the nachos nachos and a good strong stout, I had other reasons to arrive in this stunning part of the south. For between Natchez, Mississippi and Nashville, Tennessee is one of the most picturesque roads in America, the Natchez Trace Parkway. But more on that later, as I first had to wander a few back roads and find a suitable place to park my trailer. I decided to try the Natchez State Park, which is a pay campsite, but is well shaded against the hot Mississippi heat. I first introduced this area on my Walk in the Wild Side video, as its lush forests are stunning. But if poison ivy makes you a little itchy, you might want to stay to the designated trails. And today I had another destination in mind. One of my favorite history books of all time is 1491 by Charles C. Mann. It documents the new world before Columbus changed everything in 1492. And the favorite chapter is on the mound builders of the Mississippian era. Starting over a thousand years ago, the indigenous people of the southeastern continent built earthen mounds for trade, settlement, and ceremonial purposes. One of the largest just happens to be within 10 miles of Natchez. Emerald Mound is in fact the second largest temple mound in the United States, with only Monk's Mound in Cahokia, Illinois larger. It was built between 1300 and 1600 AD by the Mississippians, ancestors of the Natchez Indians. While some may be familiar with the smaller burial mounds, this was largely a ceremonial structure, a religious temple. From the base it was difficult to get it all in the viewfinder, so I had to pan the shot with an ultra wide angle lens. Out of the dense underbrush on the west side is a pathway that takes you up the mound itself. On the summit once stood a building, perhaps for the chief and his leaders.
It was truly magical to be standing on the summit, watching the sun in the east rising out of the fog. Reminds me of the temples in Guatemala, in Mexico. But this is America. This is the United States. Although it wasn't then. It's hard to give scale with just a camera, but you can see how impressive it is, how massive it is. You can only imagine what it was like a thousand years ago. You see how the sun plays with it? As the sun played on the courtyard, I played with the camera speed, seeing if I could remain calm and still deep in thought about a celebration long since past. Well, after spending a whole morning wading through wet grass, my feet got a little bit wet. As a matter of fact, my shoes are completely soaked. Now it's easy just to change my socks, put on my clogs, but it's a different issue with my boots because I'm in Mississippi. Things don't dry very quickly in Mississippi. So I need a way to dry them. And fortunately, a while ago, when I was in a hardware store, I saw this, picked it up, thought maybe someday I'd use it. It's a Max Dry Traveler Portable Footwear Dryer Warmer. And the nice thing about this is that it runs off 12 volt, which is perfect for a boondocker because that's what I run off is 12 volt. Does it work? I don't know, but this certainly seems like a good opportunity. The concept is pretty simple. You get two heating pads and place one in each boot, right side up, and slide into the toe area. The cord has a 12 volt cigarette lighter socket as a plug-in. Well, being the good salesmen that they are, they don't actually tell you in the instructions how long it takes to dry a pair of shoes. So, I'm just gonna put them in and leave it and come back later. It's 11 o'clock, so I'll come back. I'll give it five or six hours and see what happens. This gave me time to explore a little of the trace, maybe scout some potential campsites and historical markers. However, I first had to clear a roadblock. The guy was on the road. Can't leave him there. He was a little shy at first, but eventually he wandered off into the long grass. The one essential for the trip is a Natchez Trace pamphlet, available free from the National Park Service. Its tips and maps show all the attractions, and today I'm headed for Rocky Springs. Certainly one of the most peaceful, beautiful drives in America. Natchez Trace. Mm -hmm. 
At around the 46 mile marker is the Mangum Mound Site, which unlike the Emerald Mound, appears to be exclusively a burial site. There are over 80 individuals buried here, along with many ornate copper artifacts. Just before marker 55 is the Rock Springs picnic area and campsite. This is a beautiful free camping area with restrooms, picnic tables, and campfire rings. The tall trees provide lots of shade. So the question is, did the shoe dryer work? And the shoes are definitely dry. That's the good news. I can wear them. But the bad news is if you're in a little bit of a hurry, these are a little slow. They only draw about like a quarter amp an hour. I think it, it listed it as five watts, which means there's not a lot of power to these, which is good if you're, uh, you're saving power, if you're trying to be conservative. But uh, it also means it takes a long time. And I tried it for a few hours, it didn't work, or it really, it, it warmed them up, but it was only overnight that it actually dried the shoes. So yes, it works, but you gotta be patient. But anyway, I got nice warm and dry shoes, so I can go on another hike, which is what I'll do. The next morning it was time to pack up and find a new campsite. Just past Jackson was a reservoir and a cypress swamp. The Ross R. Barnett Reservoir looked like it had good camping potential, as I spotted a few pullover spots at the side of the trace. However, I thought I'd leave them till the next time I went through the area. Just past the 120 mile marker is the Tupelo Bald Cypress Swamp. If you like bugs, this place has got them. So throw on a little insect repellent and stroll on down the wooden walkway. The Tupelo is a swamp tree that loves to have its roots soak in the soggy water. Not a great place to swim, but certainly a change of scenery as you carry on up the trace roadway. One thing you may have noticed is the lack of big trucks on the trace. Why? Because it's a designated scenic byway and no trucks are allowed. But there are a lot of bicycles, so please make sure you give them room. At just under the halfway mark of the trace is the Jeff Busby Park area. It's located right after marker 193. This is another free camping spot and a great place to take a break. But take note there's only a few places available. Unfortunately, I was a little late and the campsite was full, but I had stayed there in the very same spot a few years before. Just south of Tupelo are the Bynum Mounds and a place name I just had to see, Witch's Dance. Now of course I was expecting some old ladies with pointy hats and warts in their noses doing a little do -si do through the forest. But there is a story at least. The old folks say the witches once gathered here to dance and wherever their feet touched the ground, the grass withered and died never to grow again. Impossible you say? Maybe so, but look around. Look for a hidden spot where no grass grows. Well, you know, I did find a spot where no grass grows. It was this out-of-service restroom right beside the witch's dance. 
so I think I know the real reason why the witches were dancing. Just down the road were the Bynum Mounds. These burial mounds were a lot older than the other mounds I saw, apparently from the Middle Woodland period, around 2,000 years ago. Although there were six mounds, only two stand out, and stand out they do. I couldn't help but notice that these pair of mounds resembled a woman's breasts, and indeed a young lady's remains were buried here. It could also be a symbol of Mother Nature's nurturing. As you leave Mississippi heading north, one big change is evident at Cave Spring. A little muddy. This is one thing I haven't seen for weeks. Rocks! As I entered the Tennessee part of the trace, I had only one more destination in mind. At milepost 385, is a big sign called Meriwether Lewis. Named of course for the famous explorer of the West, Lewis's gravesite is here, but that's another story. And rather than talk about the historical aspect of this area, I want to mention that the Meriwether Lewis campground is one of the best free campsites in the southeastern U.S. There's a total of 32 campsites here, all on concrete pads, with a washroom facility and drinking water. A little bit of sun, and a little bit of shade. There also seems to be a little bit of a slope, as perhaps the roadwork team forgot to bring their level. In a past video, I already showed the hiking attractions in the area, but this time I'd like to share a calm, beautiful night with a full moon and a forest full of glowing fireflies. After a peaceful night and a tranquil sunset, it seemed like heaven on earth. But not for long. One of Libya's camper with four cans of fuel made the campsite intolerable that day, so it was time to move on. 
but not without one last farewell look at the Natchez Trace Parkway and its stunning landscapes. Now I could have ended my eastern travels here, but after seeing my first mound, the Emerald Mound near Natchez, there was one site on the map that still intrigued me. After a short trip through Tennessee and Kentucky, I decided to swing through Illinois and see the mother of all mounds in the ancient city of Cahokia. The Cahokia Mound State Historic Site is located between East St. Louis and Collinsville, Illinois. It has an interpretive center and many groomed pathways. The center was closed the day I was there, so I had the whole site almost to myself. Well, I say almost, as this deer seemed very curious as to who I was. With over 2,200 acres, that's a lot of room for animals and people to stroll the trails. Although there are apparently 80 mounds here, I was completely focused on just one named Monk's Mound. At around 100 feet high, it's the largest pyramid north of Mexico. The name has nothing to do with the original purpose. It was only because some Trappist monks resided here long after Cahokia was abandoned. For that matter, even calling the lost city Cahokia is incorrect, as that was a latter tribe. Nobody knows who the original inhabitants were, but they sure left a big calling card. The view from Monk's Mound is spectacular, showing off the fertile green farmland in every direction, as Cahokia was a farming community, as well as both the biggest city and the only city north of the Rio Grande 800 years ago. St. Louis in the distance has completely overshadowed Cahokia's original population claim, with over three million people in the city and surrounding metropolis. I wondered if that other mound to the north of St. Louis was another archaeological site, and in a way it is. It's the St. Louis landfill. One thing I'm curious about is the direction it's facing. Other mounds seem to face east, but this one kind of faces south must be a reason for it. While the Emerald Mound faces the east towards the sun, Monk's Mound faces its ceremonial court in the southern horizon. Perhaps there are other heavenly bodies that played a role in its design. Artifacts left behind suggest the sun did play a role in the symbology of the ancients, but I see another representation that appears to be even more prominent. The Bird King. Certainly birds played an important part in the long forgotten culture. And there's no doubt the temple is facing the path of the migrating birds. But that's just mere speculation from a casual observer and bird lover. But who really knows what secrets are hidden on this big lump of clay? I'll leave that answer to others, as I'm just a traveler. I'm going to close with the clouds slowly rolling over the Mound of Emerald. I hope you enjoyed this video and will continue to follow me on my future travels.